An Aryan brother is without a care. He walks where the weak and the heartless won't dare. And if by chance he should stumble and lose control, his brothers will be there to help him reach his goal. For a worthy brother, no need is too great. He need not but ask, fulfillment's his fate. For an Aryan brother, death holds no fear. Vengeance will be his through his brother still here. Snatched from their cells in maximum security prisons across America, some 40 members of the infamous Aryan Brotherhood are flown to the fortress jails in Los Angeles. The biggest criminal case in U.S. history, with more than 20 defendants facing the death penalty. The most feared and deadly white gang in American prison system stands accused of hundreds of beatings, killings, drug dealing, and racketeering. These are some of the smartest, the toughest, the most savviest, and the most ruthless inmates. When you're in prison, you will know who the most powerful people are, and the Aryan Brotherhood were amongst the most powerful for one simple reason. They'll kill you. We control everything. Who lived where? Who died and who lived? We controlled the entire prison system. By following a trial of drug deals, murders, hit notes disguised by invisible ink and secret codes, investigators revealed a unique empire ran from behind bars, one that controlled a major part of the prison system. So how does society deal with its outlaws, men who live and die by their own warrior code? For the first time, members reveal their side of the story. John Grishner, once a national commissioner of the gang, now serving life for kidnapping and murder. If you bring the ruthlessness and extreme violence to a situation one or two times, you don't have to do it no more. The message gets out. George Harp, founder member of the gang, served 40 years in jail. I knew of 40 or 50 that were killed by some members of the Aryan Brotherhood in, in, in some time in one prison or another. Your loyalty to the Aryan Brotherhood has to be more than your loyalty to your best friend, your family. If they see that your loyalty is strayed, you're next. The Brotherhood's reign in hell began during the 60s among the racial tension and violence in California's prison system. At the time, the AB served a, a, a much needed purpose in California state prisons. There was a lot of like racial upheaval and the AB was designed and structured to more or less protect and defend the weaker whites. It started with a purpose and reason and didn't make sense for the prison system at that time. The Aryan Brotherhood's not a white supremacy gang like the Aryan Nations or something like that. I mean, it started out obviously with some racial orientation, but they've been allied with the Mexican Mafia and also they've had alliances with black criminal organizations which is just more about furthering the interest of the gang. To get the money and power, the Brotherhood would soon learn to manipulate the system and get help from the very people who were watching over them. Some of the guards backed the whites because uh, blacks were killing guards, you know, and, uh, and so their sympathies went, uh, went towards the whites. And they kind of an unholy alliance. It wasn't all of them or, you know, uh, but some, you know. The guards, some of them liked us. They identified with the things that, that, that we stood for, and some didn't. Sometimes we'd ask them if they would like to make some money. They didn't get paid much. And they said, yeah, well, we'll send a package to you. Have somebody mail a package. That'd be okay if you'll bring that in for us, and we'll give you $500 every time you do that. And guards, a lot of them made a, a, a lot of money that way. They brought us weapons, and they brought us information, too. And they would bring us pocket knives. Every time we went to recreation or every time we went to the shower, it was the guard's duty to come into the cell and inspect that cell to look for contraband. And there was many times we would come back into the cell, and the guard would say, just look under your pillow, and there'd be a pocket knife. So what you have behind the prison wall really is just a time capsule of racial prejudice and segregation. Violence gets attention, and the AB had everyone paying very close attention. 
that captivated everyone around them. I think it's part of the human condition to be able to influence your environment. And if you have to band together to make a statement, the only statement that other inmates and convicts will comprehend is violence. If you're in a, 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 an environment that's a violent environment, sometimes to make a social statement, to make your presence known, you have to be very violent. It's just all there is to it. And sometimes you bring that type of ruthlessness, if you bring the ruthlessness and extreme violence to a situation one or two times, you don't have to do it no more. Why make an enemy? Why move on somebody and leave your enemy alive so he can come back around and get you or get yours or get your family or whatever? You don't do that. If it's serious enough to move on them, you, you take them out. And then you do it in such a way where it's so vicious that everybody, even in a violent environment, takes notice. They say, wow. You know, and they step back and they say, don't mess with them because you'll get that. I mean, that's, that's how you control the environments. Then once you do that and people understand it, then you can get down and do business. What's important for people to understand about prison is being in prison is nothing like being in the free world. In other words, there is a completely different moral standard and a completely different society within a society. If you meet an Aryan Brotherhood, within five minutes you'll know this guy's capable of ripping out your heart. It's the intensity. It's the look. It's the dead eyes. It's everything about them. It wasn't just brute force that they ruled by. The gang's reputation created a psychology of fear. They drew inspiration from the prison library shelves. Many had adopted the brand as an alternative name for the Brotherhood. These stories feature dangerous outlaws who dispense their own display of tough justice. So essentially what the AB did was allow convicts to reinvent themselves in prison. It was like becoming a gunslinger, a character from a Louis Lamar novel. You chewed tobacco and spit while sharpening shanks on the cell floor to the early morning hours. They became the alpha male learning how to knife fight and box. In other words, the AB became hell on wheels. Always on go and always ready. Michael Thompson helped mastermind a new move in Chino Prison in 1982. Inmates there acting as their own defense attorneys in a trial were able to call all brand members across California's witnesses. When they all arrived, they held an Aryan Brotherhood Congress to rebrand the gang. The goal was to transform the AB into a criminal, racketeering organization like the Mafia, rather than some dumb prison gang hooked on racial violence and drug abuse. They wanted power inside and outside the prisons. Michael Thompson was voted along with nine others to counsel the AB and redirect its priorities from race to rackets. They even had pictures of all of them together in the yard like they were some politicians starting a new campaign. But the AB was voting on murder, extortion, drugs, and racketeering. They had to find a way to control members who posed a threat outside of prison walls. The first order of business was what do they do if someone decides to leave the gang and cooperate with the government? At that point, they made a new rule that if you can't get that person, a member of their family would be killed. When unable to hit a brand member who betrayed the gang because the government put them up in a safe house, the leadership gave orders to kill the informer's father on the front porch of his home. It was a big step for the brand, an organized killing outside of prison walls. They chose Curtis Price as the executioner because he was shortly to be released on parole. And Curtis was honored to be chosen to do a killing for the brand. He had numerous amount of drug connections in Northern California, and that's who he would contact for weapons. When he got out, he actually sent a letter to Michael Thompson, but that letter was intercepted by prison officials, and it gave them the crucial information about the inner workings of the brand. While officials were examining the letters, officials seemed to think that the letter was just your, you know, average run of the mill letter. But when they looked on the left margin, they noticed it looked like it was wet, but then dried again would suggest the presence of invisible ink. There are many ways to do this, but the Aryan Brotherhood used urine to accomplish this task. The officials used a blue light and said, need, contract, witness, problem, could walk. 
the letter requesting permission to kill. That letter was later used in court, which sent Curtis Price to death row, where he would rot until August 21st, when he succumbed to his death by natural causes. As for Michael Thompson, he began to reflect on his life and realized he was turning into a monster. He began to look inside himself. This wasn't combat. This was no warrior code. He felt sick with betrayal, self-betrayal, so he rolled out. In other words, he checked in and debriefed. He was still under the guards 24 hours a day, locked in a maximum security jail to protect him from their knives and to protect the streets from Michael Thompson. That cold-blooded murderer provoked Mike Thompson to become the first major informer within the brand. He revealed just how powerful the gang was becoming and the lengths of brutality the gang was willing to go to. By the mid-80s, the gang was gaining power not only inside prison, but beyond the wall. To try and stop their power, high-ranking members were locked in isolation cells 24 hours a day. When some people are put in isolation, they go crazy. But some people learn to adapt and actually become very clever. You would think by this point the AB wouldn't be able to connect to other members. But in prison you don't need cell phones when you have toilets, the vents, and all these other ways to communicate with one another. Even when going to wreck from isolation, the wreck yard could be closed to the main line or another cell with a window, and they would use that to their benefit. Through sign language, they would give orders. If that didn't work, they were still allowed to send letters to people on the outside. Even though the prison screens letters coming in and out of prison, the brand would still manage to get letters out using a plethora of different methods. Decoding these letters wasn't easy. Investigators uncovered a series of complex codes, the most remarkable of which came from a book in the prison library. The writings of the 17th century British spy Sir Francis Bacon, the most sophisticated method of which was something called the biliteral cipher. What you need for that is two different alphabets, which look like one another but are distinguishable from one another. Some letters would have little tails on the end of them which are barely noticeable. They're very subtle. After realizing it's written in two different styles of handwriting, you can separate them witherly and the letters without forming a pattern of A's and B's, which Sir Francis Bacon invented. There are 25 different combinations of A's and B's, and each one represents different letters from the alphabet. By going a step further and replacing these letters with a substitute alphabet, a long and confusing letter finally reveals its short message and deadly command. Now I already know what you're thinking. Even with this code, how does the sender, a man that's in prison, most likely confinement, get that letter delivered outside of prison walls. And that's where the AB capitalized, using young, easy, manipulated women, which are commonly referred to as mules. One of the wonderful things about this is that they're stuck in the jail. They're in the slammer. I feel like it's great they're behind bars because I'm free. I can walk in there and I can walk out of there. Yep and they leave me to fuck alone. We get the best end of the deal, that's for sure. We do them little favors and then we get paid real well. We do and sometimes we get a little extra too, don't mm -hmm. we? They don't know about that. Girlfriends and wives were observed bringing in drugs in federal prison Leavenworth and brazenly passing them to brand members in the visitation room. This was a visit between an inmate and his girlfriend. What happened was she had brought the drugs in the waistband of her dress. During the process of the visit, she would pull the drugs out of her waistband, put them in her hands, and it would stay there for a little while, but eventually she would hand the drugs to the inmate. He kept them for a while, then on the video you can see him look around for a minute, then take the drugs, pops them into his mouth, and swallows them. What distinguished the AB from other gangs was they went for quality, not quantity. They wanted to channel people with special talents for the benefit of the AB. While guards ruled the perimeter, the brand ruled the inside.